Uh, hello again, MMI uh, 711, Sequence Models and Multimedia. Um, previous week, we've talked about the embedding layer. Why do we need embedding? And um, we made a sort of introduction to the concept of natural language processing, although it is not our context. I mean, uh, NLP, I mean, in its entire context is beyond the scope of this course. So I don't have to tell you this, but making an introduction to it was uh, beneficial for us because um, this is a sequence models course. And NLP has a very strong existence for in this field of sequence models. And actually, uh, that next week, we are going to see that one of the breakthroughs, the recent breakthroughs of uh, AI belong to NLP field, which is transformers. However, has been applied to different type of multimedia signals as well, like vision. But before getting to transformers, we've learned, we've learned embeddings, we've learned encoder-decoder architecture, we have, we have learned the importance of recurrency for sequence modeling. In between, before we get to transformers, because the name of the paper that the transformers were introduced was called attention is all you need. So we have one thing left to discuss, the attention itself. So this week we are going to talk about first the recurrent model of attention because apparently there are different models of attention. Attention in the end is a concept that we, uh, is a single concept, I mean, there are different mechanisms to achieve it, but uh, in the end you reach to this, to the same thing, the attention is, we are going to discuss this, the focus on a, uh, on a signal, where the focus is. We are going to see what it is in the following slides. First, we are going to talk about the recurrent model of attention. Then we are going to talk about how it's being applied to vision because attention was first introduced for NLP, I mean, language translation. Then it is applied to vision. And similarly, transformers were first for machine translation, language translation, NLP, then they were applied to vision. So same story goes on there. And we are going to see that the current model of attention is not the only model of attention. Actually, we have another type of attention, which is context-based attention, which exists in transformers. So we are going to see models of attention this week, which will completely prepare us for the concept of transformers next week. Good. So let me continue. Just a little reminder. Remember, uh, the previous week and the one before, we've talked about the architecture of an encoder and decoder. We said that an encoder-decoder architecture is a widely used uh, idea in computer science and computer engineering and hardware engineering. When you're trying to, uh, I mean, maybe I should use that word, transform a signal to into another signal, you first encode the incoming signal, you obtain an encoded representation. Then you decode this encoded latent representation into a new signal. So it is like transforming a sequence into another sequence. That's why in sequence to sequence problems, many to many problems in sequence modeling, encoder decoder design is widely used. And you will remember that this is how actually the journey of deep NLP, neural NLP started. Remember, we were talking when we were talking about the uh, encoder decoder design. We talked about a, a pioneering paper by Cho et al. Uh, in 2014. They've come up with this idea that we have a RNN encoder, we have a RNN decoder, and it works better for machine translation. And then Sutskever came up with the idea of using LSTMs instead of RNNs, which worked better. And then Badanau transformed this LSTM encoder decoder architecture into an architecture which has this concept of attention. So um, I'm going to, to, these are the slides from the previous week. You may recognize them. We've, we've talked about loss functions of NLP. I'm not going to talk about them this week. I'm going to quickly remind you the encoder decoder architecture because that's what we need. Then I'm going to quickly jump to attention. So the loss is calculated somehow. And when we get deeper into the architecture of these encoder decoders, what we see is this 
approach kind of allows us the input and output sequence to have to get separated. That's why I have flexibility. I mean, you could encode an incoming sequence with an LSTM and you could decode it to a sequence. And when you change the decoder, you could decode it to another sequence. So imagine you have a machine translation uh, system where you translate a Turkish language, for example, into multiple languages at the same time. So in this case, because of this flexibility, you will have a single encoder, however, multiple decoders for each different language to translate to. So this is, this was, this is still in sequence to sequence modeling, not only for NLP, for multimedia signals that we are going to use. A relevant architecture, guys. The architecture within the encoder and decoder is going to change and become much complicated. However, encoder decoder being separated from each other. And uh, the fact that they can be used separately for different applications still applies today. And next week, we are going to talk about the transformer. Transformer will have an encoder and decoder and today, only the encoder part of the transformer is being used in Google and Amazon search daily, which is called BERT. We're going to get there. I'm trying to give you a perspective on the encoder and decoder design and how important they are uh, today for our flexibility and for our designs. Okay, let me continue then. So um, this approach still presented some downsides. I mean, not, not the approach, but the earlier versions of this approach, because remember Cho et al with vanilla RNNs or simple RNNs encoder decoder. Then Suskaver and Vinyas and Lee having this LSTM encoder decoder architecture. However, what comes after them was uh, a team uh, where the first author was some guy called Badano in 2015 they have come up with this idea that we could put an additional layer between the encoder and decoder, which will increase the efficiency of translation. How? Now, the potential issue of encoder and decoder design is the potential problem is the system, the architecture needs to be able to compress all the necessary information of the source sequence entirely into this fixed length vector. I guess that's clear. I mean, you have an entire system sentence. Uh, am I intelligence artificiale? Kind of Italian sentence. I love artificial intelligence. Amo, I don't, I don't speak Italian, so sorry for the uh, <laughs> wrong Italian speech, whatever. So this is a four letter sentence. It is, I mean, uh, fairly easy to maybe compress into a fixed length presentation, however, when you construct a long sentence, because there are long sentences in literature and in any context in scientific papers, it becomes difficult to compress that, encode that sentence, that sequence into a single vector. And actually, this was a fact. This was a fact. One of the, uh, you remember Cho et al. They, they were the first guys that introduced this idea of encoder decoders with, with simpler RNNs. In their extension paper, in their continuation paper, these guys showed that the indeed the perf showed that the performance of a basic encoder decoder, the one that they um, uh, introduced, uh, the, its performance deteriorates rapidly as the length of the input sequence increases. That was a problem. That was the main problem, guys. And this is from their paper. So this is the sentence length, which is the sequence length in this case, and this is the below score. And as the sentence <clears throat> length uh, got larger and longer and longer, the performance was much worse. So if we could, we could safely say that if the input sentence is too long with respect to this fixed dimension, then we couldn't avoid the loss of some important information because the start of the sequence becomes so long and so far away that the system learns the difficulty, have to have difficulty to learn the entire representation. And actually it makes sense for this RNN, for this architecture, because although you see four RNNs here, there's actually a single RNN. This is an unrolled in time representation, which is something you already know. What happens is each time you feed a token in NLP, they are the words. In video processing, they are the frames, it doesn't matter. What happens is, 
you are updating the internal hidden states of the encoder. And while you're updating the hidden states, you're losing the previous hidden states. And if the sentence is way too long, you're kind of forgetting everything. Uh, for, I don't know, 25 word sentence, you're forgetting the first sentence because you're overwriting the hidden states. So if there was a way, I mean, which could, which could make us not forget that hidden state entirely, mechanism, maybe it could help. I guess that was what Badano and the team thought about when they were designing the first recurrent model of attention. So that's the attention mechanism, guys. Attention mechanism, uh, I'm going to say what I, I should be saying in the end first, then I'm going to explain, is a mechanism that will ha help the system, the encoder-decoder model, not to forget the previous hidden states. Okay, let's keep this in mind. And let's get to this idea of attention because attention is an idea that comes from cognitive science. Okay. So um, during the encoding phase, at each step of the first RNN, LSTM or RNN, doesn't matter. Maybe we could store hidden states related to each of the input sentences. I mean, that's a step, right? Because we don't want to forget them. Let's keep them first. Let's not overwrite them. Let, let's overwrite them for the LSTM or the RNA itself because the RNA needs to process like that. However, let's keep them the first step so we don't forget these. I mean, we are passing the hidden state to the next time, uh, uh, unrolled in time RNN cell, same cell. However, we keep it somewhere. And during the decoding phase, at each step, we are kind of, what we're doing is, we are taking into account the weighted average of the previously stored encoder hidden states. And that weighted average mechanism is actually what we learn and what creates the attention. The weights of this average depend directly from the previous decoder hidden state and are learned during training in order to give more attention to the encoder's hidden states related to the words that are most aligned semantically or synthetically, or I don't know if in any means with the translated word. So when you are using, when you're creating this RNN cell, in addition to, let me get my pen, in addition to hidden state that is being fed here, you are, you just had, uh, had these hidden states saved, not the words hidden state saved. You take an average of them and you also feed them here. And before you feed them, you make a mathematical operation between the current hidden state of the decoder with the average hidden state sum of the encoder. So you somehow found, find the relation between the current hidden state to the previous hidden states of the encoder. And somehow what happens is for this, for this hidden state, which comes with intelligence, the weights are aligned such that this hidden state would be more related to the word intelligentsia in the encoder. So that's roughly what it is. We are going to delve into the very mathematics and simple operations of it, don't worry. I'm trying to give you the idea of how it works, okay? So a summary is at each step of the decoder, we highlight the information of a small subset of the input or the entire input, I don't know, strictly related specifically to the current translation step. So there's a nice figure from this guy's blog which shows the generic scheme of decoding phase using attention mechanism. So the intensity, so there's, mm, I said, you remember what I said was the uh, input is weight. There are weights for this, uh, each hidden state, which I say, they are weighted and they are being fed as an additional layer, which I'm going to be called C vectors because the C is the C of context. These are the context vectors. And combined with, somehow uh, we find the similarity of this context vector to the decoder hidden state and are fed accordingly. So when you do that, what you're supposed to do, I mean, what supposedly happens actually, it happens, but so since we didn't try it on our own yet, 
I'm telling you that that's the case. Some hidden states have stronger weights. So for example, when I'm translating the Italian sentence, for the love word, for the artificial C C4, H3, the intelligentsia words, hidden state, has more weight. I mean, the, the red and pinkish colors are kind of the intensities of the weights uh, are trying to be, I mean, depicted in this figure. So it is somehow like this. So as you can see, for the first word, uh, start, uh, 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 the um, the alignment of the weights change, and which kind of shows the relation between this English sentence and the Italian sentence for the word intelligenza. When we come to C four, where we have artificial, I have the intelligence artificial. So I think that's that's what what it's all about. How can we do this? How can we make the system learn it? Okay, there is this mechanism. We can create this mechanism and it will make a computational graph. But how does it exactly work? And I'm sure you want to know about this. So uh, the key fact of attention mechanism is the context vector. This context vector is the weighted average of the hidden states of the encoder. Note that this context vector is specific for the sequence step T. So at each step, at each time instance, at each token instance, for an, for an NLP is the token dimension. So it is not time. Each words come in and it's the next word. But for a video uh, processing algorithm, which uses attention and you can't do networks, it is time or the frames, whatever. So at each word, we create a different context. So which is like uh, representing the context of that input word within the given sentence. Because you know what the definition of context is. A word's meaning can change context in different sentences. So this context vector is exactly that context. The meaning of this word with relation to the within the sentence. So that if we understand the context of this word, we could translate it better when we try to. Okay, so in this way, the generation of each different word building up the output translation at the decoder part will give more importance to the word, which was more, I mean, strong, uh, which was stronger when creating the weighted average context word. Well, that's the idea. I mean, if it can work, well, that will help a lot because this internal representation will not only carry all the information, but along the way, the information will be passed with context. So the only thing we need to find here is these weighting, the alignments, alignments of the hidden vectors to the context. Vector. So I guess you've got the idea now, but you, have, you should have many questions at this point. How are, how are these weights learned? How exactly we feed the loss to this layer? How do we backpropagate? Is this can be thought of a separate layer? How can we test and debug it? You're right. What we're trying to do is we're trying to get, uh, to understand the meaning of attention first. Then we are going to get to the very uh, low level of this today. So we're at the highest level now, trying to understand what it is. Then we are going to get to the lowest level. Okay. So. Um, so this Dmitry Vatanavu in their paper, uh, 2004, before it was applied to encoder-decoder design, because these guys talked about the idea of attention in a previous paper in 2004, which is Neural Machine Translation by Joint Learning and blah, blah. Uh, and it was a paper again led by Bengu. So they had this mechanism coming up. So we need some sort of mechanism to carry the hidden states of the input sequence to a further state when we are translating or transforming the sequence into another sequence, they had this in mind. So this paper actually laid the foundation of the famous paper today, the attention of all you need, but it was funny at all, which is the transformers paper, which we are going to cover next week, okay? So the attention is basically the idea of an interface connecting the encoder and decoder that provides the decoder with information from every encoder hidden state. 
Okay. With this framework, the model is able to selectively focus on valuable parts of the input, the requ required part, parts of the input. So it's like a focus. This helps the model to cope with, to cope with, I mean, to efficiently learn long input sequences. Because when the input sequence is very long, we at least know where to focus. When you know where to focus, actually, that's real intelligence. I mean, cognitive scientists discuss that our uh, our high intelligence depends on the factor of us knowing exactly what to focus and what not to focus more, because there is just high level of information just flowing into us all the time. And we always can focus. Uh, so uh, that's the attention mechanism being applied to test uh, this uh, sequence to sequence problem. And is it a layer? Yes, it can be modeled as a layer because it can be modeled as a part of a computational graph. Something which is a part of a computational graph can be thought of as a layer because you'll have an input output relation in that computational graph. In the forward pass, it will be an input output relation. In the backward pass, it will be the incoming gradient, outgoing gradient relation. If you can just define something in a computational graph in a limited region, you can call it a layer. And we will call it a layer. Like they did call it a layer. Okay, so another figure that I found from another block. I mean, people are very keen on creating very nice figures for these attention layers. And actually, I'm grateful for them because uh, they, they help us understand this concept. And I, I strongly recommend you visit their blog as well. They have nice explanations. I try to uh, make a summary. I try to boil down the important stuff for the very beginners in these lectures and slides. So I strongly recommend you uh, visit their blogs. Okay, mm, so this is another representation of what the attention layer for the um, encoder decoder recurrent architecture, recurrent decoder decoder architecture. And in this case, the architecture is shown more like an attention layer. But this time we are going to go into the details of this attention layer in a more, I mean, deeper way, so that you will understand the mechanism better. Because in this mechanism, there is this dot product business that we are going to learn now in this uh, figure, which is also applied in transformers attention as well, which is or the, a different type of attention. But we have this idea. So understanding this figure will help you understand what is the exact relation of this type of attention with the other type of attention we are going to learn for transformers. Anyways, let me continue. So we already know that attention is an interface between the encoder and the decoder that provides the decoder with information from every encoder hidden state. I think that's clear. If it is not clear, please ask me any questions that you want to ask, okay? Now, what does this mean mathematically? With this setting, the model is able to selectively focus on the useful or the required parts of the input sequence. And consequently, learn the alignment between them, learn what part is stronger for the current state of the decoder so that it could cope with long input sentences. Because when the input sentence is long, this to the decoder part, these red dots here, as you can see, are the hidden states passed. This is the encoder. These are the inputs coming into the encoder. So these are the hidden states at each time instant token step at each word. And this is only the, the past thing if you don't have a, any attention. But if you have attention in between, we have an entire layer that's going to help us. So what it does, so there are two types of this recurrent type of attention. I mean, there are two types of attention broadly, this recurrent type of attention and the attentions, the transformers context-based attention, but we are not there yet. This type of attention, this type of attention, this recurrent model of attention is uh, proposed by about an hour, can be thought of two different categories. These two type of recurrent attention was um, uh, introduced by Manning. You remember Manning, the guy from Stanford's 224 deep NLP course is also in the game. So what he said was, if you use all the hidden states of the encoder that relates to the decoder, how we are going to relate it, we are going to see it soon in the, in the following slides. If you use them all, it will be called global 
recurrent model of attention. If you use some local, I mean, neighboring state, so if you're trying to construct some hidden state, not you're, you're, you're not using all the encoded hidden state, but some of them, it's called local attention. Uh, what, how does it help? It helps to build more efficient systems. However, usually for the recurrent model of attention, the global version is used. So we'll be using all the encoded hidden states. I mean, if you're using attention, you'll most probably be using some sort of transformer architecture, but we are not there yet. So if you're using a recurrent encoder decoder model with a attention layer in between, it will be usually the global attention. And actually uh, in the next hour, um, I'm going to be applying this recurrent model of attention with encoder decoders into vision. And there it will be all global attention because that's, you'll see what that, what it means. So we have this idea of global or local attention. We could use all the hidden states or we could use some of them. We are going to be using all of them, okay? So uh, nice uh, animation from this guy, Thank you to him. thanks to him. What we're doing is we're coming in. So the first word, the second word, the third word, we are keeping the hidden states. And in the finally decoder uh, hidden state is being fed to the decoder as the initial hidden state of the decoder part. So this is the encoder part, this is the decoder part. So what happens is we are, the first step is to prepare and save all the encoder hidden states if it's global attention, the green ones. So in this example, we have four hidden states just like that Italian word. Amoi, I don't remember intelligence, artificial, uh, uh, <laughs> I don't remember it. So we have the four hidden states and we have the current hidden state of the decoder, which is the first one. Note that the last consolidated encoder hidden state is also fed here. So I'm keeping these hidden states. So this is being fed here. This is being fed, this is the hidden state and it is being also fed to the decoder as well because that's how it works. So the output of the first time step of the decoder is called the first decoder hidden state. So the output of the first decoder's hidden state, this guy is called the decoder state, okay? So I'm feeding this here and I've got this here. So somehow I'm going to calculate a weighted average of these vectors and I'm going to feed that as a context vector to here. How do, how do I do it mathematically? How do I do it mathematically is I calculate an alignment between the encoder hidden states and the decoder hidden state. Alignment is, you know, you know what, I know, what the word alignment means in English, right? Alignment is like your direction. So why it is called alignment is, in my opinion, what you calculate is you calculate the dot product of the decoder hidden state and the encoder hidden state. So this is an n by one vector, the same like decoder hidden state is, you take a dot product. When you take a dot product, actually in geometry, in an n-dimensional space, you find the projection of a vector onto another vector. So it is like how aligned that vector is. If they are perpendicularly aligned, the dot product will be zero. If they are parallel, the dot product will be one or higher. I mean, we, we don't have to normalize them. We don't, we don't necessarily say, I'm saying one, but you don't necessarily say that these are orthonormal vectors. They are not. So they are not unit vectors. So as they are, if they are parallel, they are going to be one. If they are perpendicular in the n-dimensional space, because being perpendicular in an n-dimensional space is a complex subject, but they can be, which means their dot, dot product is one. It will create a score, which is the alignment score. So how align the input hidden state vector is to the decoder hidden state. Or maybe I should have said how similar, because dot product is in an n-dimensional vector space is like a similarity. If you're perpendicular orthogonal to it, then you are not similar. If you're parallel to it, you are similar. And think of it that way, these, the, the vectors, the dimensions of these vectors represent something that we don't understand. And if those vectors all together in that hyperspace are parallel, they kind of represent the same thing. That's why we call the alignment or the similarity, if you like to call it. Okay, we calculate a score. I think it's pretty much clear. What I'm trying to understand is for the first sentence in this case, 
the similarity of the hidden state to the previous hidden states. I mean, this was for the first decoder state, but in this example, it is the fourth hidden state. So I don't care. So, and this is from English to Italian. So Italian, English to French, it doesn't matter. But that's the idea. Okay. I'm calculating the scores. So the alignment score function is actually a dot product at Bandana Ueto, but it can be changed. It can be weighted, it can be learned. You don't have to do it that way. But for the sake of simplicity, but then we keep it, kept it that way. And it's still the conventionally used algorithm to calculate the alignment vector. However, uh, in transformers, we have another mechanism that we use uh, some sort of matrices, which we are going to see today. Don't worry about it. But in this very simple of recurrent model of attention, that's the idea. And it makes sense. We are trying to understand how similar the encoder hidden state is to the decoder hidden state. Actually, by creating this mechanism, we are pushing the system to learn itself in a way, in this way, that the decoder hidden state and the encoder hidden state will be comparable to each other because we are training it that way. When you have this layer in between, the system will push itself to satisfy this criteria. So, you are making it this way. I mean, uh, you may ask, why, why would they be similar to each other? I mean, why, how do you know that they are similar to each other? I don't, but I'm creating this mechanism. I am training this system so that it becomes this, it constructs this mechanism inside it. Good. So what I have is, so these are some number examples. Imagine it's a, just like in this example, it's a, a three length long vector uh, in the decoder state. Just a second, Sanya. Uh, sorry, uh, it's a, a three long vector. Both of them, they must be the same. And these are the numbers. I told you they are not unit vectors. And I calculate the dot products. And when you calculate the dot products or the hidden vectors to the decoder hidden vector, you get these numbers. So this is 15, this is 60, this is 15, this is 35 kind of. There is nothing else. So I'd imagine if this is 60, it is kind of the second word is more related to this next word is going, that is going to be created, which makes sense. I mean, second decoder hidden state being more related to the second vector. Okay. So what I do next is I normalize these scores into a probability distribution using the softmax. So you calculate the softmax. When you calculate softmax for these values, the 60 becomes something like one. So it's like a, a binary distribution. This guy being more important than the other ones being less important. So these are softmax. In the mechanism of Badano, this is what happens. So you have a score function now. Remember I said we needed some weights to calculate the weighted average. These are the weights. And when you're doing a weight multiplication, you want the weights to add up to one. That's what softmax did for us. And you multiply these weights with the hidden states. Okay, so the alignment was calculated by using both the hidden state and the decoder state. We have this alignment normalized, and this is being used as a weight. This weight for this hidden state, this weight for hidden state, and I'm multiplying them. So in this example, because of the certain max, this is going to be one and it's going to be zero. So it is like a weighted average, but the strongest part will be, it, it would be this one. I mean, for this mathematical example, it will be just that one, but it doesn't matter. And what I do is I sum them up and I have the context vector. So context vector is an aggregated information of the alignment vectors from the previous step, right? And this context vector, is directly being fed to the next layer. I mean, next uh, layer, because it's, a, it's the next layer in the unrolled in time representation. To the, it's being fed to the decoder. Uh, how are you going to feed it? Are you going to feed it in the input? Are you going to feed it in the uh, hidden state by concatenating to the hidden state of the decoder? Well, it doesn't matter, by the way. It doesn't matter. They feed it to the concatenated to the decoder hidden state and feed it that way, but doesn't matter because you know how uh, RNN models work. I mean, 
uh, you're feeding it as an input or concatenate key, it doesn't matter. It's going to be multiplied by some weights. And wherever you feed it, the system will learn the weights accordingly. So uh, there are different approaches. So it doesn't matter. It doesn't, it doesn't make a difference. So this is the first recurrent model of attention, guys. And it's a very nice idea because it is a, a handcrafted design of the idea of attention in um, cognitive science applied to this strong encoder-decoder sequence-to-sequence models. Okay, any questions about the figure? Because I think it's quite simple, but when you understand it, it's very simple. If you don't understand it, it can be confusing. Any questions? Simple. So it's NLP. So we are multimedia guys. We are multimedia people. I mean, this is a course in multimedia informatics department. So we should be able to apply this to different multimedia signals, right? For example, any sequence that can create any model that can create a sequence out from another sequence, because this is this is a sequence to sequence model mechanism. When we're when we're creating the output sequence tokens, we are using this mechanism. So it is not a many-to-one problem mechanism. This is a many-to-many -many problem mechanism. I don't have to tell you this. So let's learn ways to apply this to different multimedia signals. Maybe we could, in future, apply it to earthquakes. Think of a sequence-to-sequence -sequence problem in an earthquake. Imagine I have a signal, uh, the strong motion, uh, sensory motion, uh, coming to my earthquake station somewhere and I want to learn what is the strong motion at another station at a virtual station that I don't have that's a sequence to sequence problem can I apply this mechanism to there as well well you can to understand how we are going to first go over an application of this idea on vision but before getting to the vision part I'm going to talk about I'm going to talk about the attention mechanism in cognitive science. So that with this architecture that we currently understood, and with this idea of attention, we have a solid understanding of it. So attention in general, which is put by Alex Graves, which is a perfect guy. It is the attention through time. Memory, sorry, memory is attention through time. So actually in a sequence, where you focus is actually how you create memory. And this is true for the literature of the cognitive science as well. In psychology, attention is the cognitive process of selectively concentrating on one or few things while ignoring others. I mean, cognitive scientists have been saying this for maybe a uh, hundred years now. So this is a concept taken from psychology and applied to computer science. So our ability to focus one thing and ignore the others has a vital role in guiding cognition, understanding the world. So not only does this allow us to pick information from noisy data, because the, the incoming data in the real world is very noisy. The famous, you know, the cocktail party problem. The cocktail party problem is you're in a cocktail party, there are like, tens of people, and there's uh, everybody speaking at the same time, there is music, and it is impossible to make out somebody's voice, but we do. You just listen to the person that you focus. We have that capability, that, that, that signal processing capability makes us the intelligent beings. So it will allow us, so not only this, not only this, it also allows us to pursue one significant thought at a time. And has to remember one event rather than the others. Not, this is not event, this is event. So this attention mechanism is actually one of the fundamental mechanisms of uh, artificial intelligence. That's why very important. That is why, that's why it's very important. That's why in a very recent interview, Jeffrey Hinton, um, in MIT Press, I've shared it in, on Instagram, maybe you've seen it uh, in MIT Press or in some uh, LinkedIn uh, post. Uh, Jeffrey Hinton says that using attention was one of the breakthroughs of AI. And after some tens or twenties of uh, breakthroughs after, we will have AI doing what all humans do. So attention was a breakthrough for AI. Okay. So when we come to neural nets, neural nets, even the most basic architectures like artificial intelligence, 
uh, artificial neural networks. Natural learn a form of implicit attention. So what they do is in their fully connected layers, they try to learn what to focus on, what not to focus. But the mechanism is not designed in there. So that's why it is difficult to train them. So for example, extracting high level features using a CNN is actually learning what to focus and what not to focus, what to look for. So why we design a handcrafted solid definition of attention then? So attention mechanism emerged as an improvement over the encoder decoder based neural machine translation system. Attention, what we refer to today is a mechanism within the sequence to sequence problem. So when we are creating the next token of the output sequence, the attention mechanism is to what to focus in the input sequence. So our model of attention is limited to sequence to sequence problems. And in this very first model of attention, which is by Badano, this paper in 2015, the attention uh, is defined as a layer between the encoder, the recurrent decoder and the recurrent decoder. However, this definition of attention will be, um, uh, will be improved when we come to transforms. And it's time for a break, but bear with me. I'm going to get to the vision part and give a break when, when I come uh, to that point. So the encoder LSTM, for, because uh, I mean, ha, uh, by the way, uh, so uh, this Badano papers was using an encoder decoder model, which included LSTMs not uh, simple uh, RNS. In this encoder LSTM, the encoder LSTM is used to process the entire input sequence and encode it into a context vector using the attention layer, which is the, um, which is not, it's not the context vector, actually this is the last hidden state vector. So let me not confuse you. Um, so, uh, in the previous version, in the previous version. So, uh, sorry, uh, the idea was when we didn't use the attention, the encoder LSTM created this context vector only using the last hidden state of the encoder. However, with the attention layer, we have a dynamic changing context vector, which is shaped by the decoder hidden state. Okay. So, uh, this is another representation of actually, this is from the original paper of Batano. I wanted to put that figure as well because this is how they uh, represented themselves. So the, the attention mechanism emerges an improvement over the encoder, encoder neural machine translation system. In this recurrent model of attention, both encoder and decoder are stacks of recurrent units. Batano put emphasis on embeddings of the words in the input while creating the context vector out of the hidden states of the vector. And they did this by simply taking a weighted sum of the hidden states and the weighted sums were calculated by this score function, which is created by the alignment of the decoder hidden state to the encoder hidden state. Okay, I think we have an idea of attention in recurrent encoder decoder architectures. In the next hour, I'm going to continue this model of attention for vision. But before that, I'm going to give a break. And if you have any questions, I'd like to answer them.